Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Russell Sage Foundation, the Malkin Fund, May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. And when I first saw today's guest in action, he was in his decade-long leadership role in commercial broadcasting as president of Westinghouse Television and chairman of Group W Satellite Communications. But then every so often for the next 20 years, William F. Baker would join me here on The Open Mind in his key leadership role in public broadcasting as president and CEO of the Educational Broadcasting Corporation, the parent company of New York's highly honored WNET-TV, Channel 13, and of WLIW-TV, Channel 21. And now, as president emeritus, Bill Baker has honed fine his earlier academic skills as a PhD in communications and organizational behavior and his present association with Columbia and Fordham Universities, joining with psychologist Michael O'Malley to write Leading with Kindness, How Good People Consistently Get Superior Results, a particularly timely study when American leadership so much needs to get superior results. Indeed, I would ask my guest if he ever dreamed his book about leadership would surface at such a leadership challenge time in our history? Fair question, Bill? Uh, a very fair question. Thank you for having me uh, on your program again. I just love being here. I took the train in uh, today, and my wife was saying, boy, you're going to have a good time <laughs> on that program. Well, let's have it. <laughs> so I, I'm prepared to. To answer your question, uh, yeah, I mean, I didn't, uh, I didn't really uh, expect uh, all of this terrible stuff to happen in the economy. I knew there was something wrong with the economy, and I have known for a long time that America has had a leadership-challenged uh, 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 workforce but, uh, and uh, leadership-challenged industries, but, uh, but I didn't think all of this would happen to such great drama. And it saddens me greatly, and perhaps much of it could have been prevented. And uh, that rips my heart out. But on the other hand, uh, maybe we can prevent in the future from happening again. With better leadership. With better leadership. You know, one of the things that uh, Michael O'Malley and I did uh, uh, with our publisher, the uh, American Management Association, we did a survey of their huge database that looked at, uh, they had 25,000 members. And we looked uh, and we measured that group, uh, sampled that group. And we asked them about the kind of leadership they had. And now uh, they may be uh, you know, a little bit more uh, informed and enlightened than most uh, databases. But, uh, and a good percentage of them said they had kind leaders. But those that didn't have kind leaders said things like, um, uh, well, I speak openly and candidly to my boss. 42% uh, who had bully bosses said, uh, that they didn't speak uh, con uh, openly to their bosses, whereas 73% said they did if they had kind bosses. And my boss really listens to what I said. Only 24% of those uh, who have bully bosses said that uh, their bosses listened to what they said, whereas 84% of those who had kind bosses did. And it made me reflect upon what has happened in Wall Street and in business in America 
you know, some of these uh, CEOs from Wall Street companies whose companies were run right over the cliff into bankruptcy testified, I didn't know what was happening. I didn't realize this was going on. And the answer was they were probably telling the truth to these committees, that uh, they may have been such tough leaders that they didn't hear from the people down below who really did know what was going on, that they were in trouble. And if they would have had that kind of communication, maybe a lot of this, uh, this that has happened on Wall Street and uh, in Main Street in America could have been prevented. Interesting, particularly interesting, and that's why I asked you that question, because as I read Leading with Kindness, uh, I couldn't help but think, my gosh, at this time, everybody, everyone in business ought to be going out and getting Bill's book, mm -hmm. because it seems like such an object lesson. I remember in, um, uh, in Plato's dialogues, uh, I remember what the, the old man who was a gadfly buzzing around uh, the horse, the public uh, well-being, the gadfly who reported on things as they were not and should have been, mm -hmm. was the one who was shunted aside much to the uh, detriment of the city-state. And you're saying when a leader acts unkindly toward those who would wish to report what is going on, as only those down the line could know, so poorly treated, uh, deals with people without kindness, that he never gets this information. He never gets the information. So you, in effect, you know, you can lead with terror for uh, quite a while and get away with it, but only if you're riding the wave and things are going well. If you need information from down below, as inevitably you do, as to what the customer's thinking, what's going on uh, in the real world, you have to have communication with the, uh, w with the, with the staff and uh, workforce below you. And it, uh, it, it, it has been, and, it, and it's interesting because I spent about four or five months in Germany at the American Academy in Berlin right after I retired from uh, Channel 13 and Channel 21. And I was interested in, uh, I was writing this book then along with my co-author Michael O'Malley. And um, my wife and I went and uh, visited a lot of companies in Germany. And I expected there to be kind of a top-down management system in Germany, that kind of, you know, mm -hmm. German way. Well, it was quite the contrary. First of all, 90% uh, of all the companies in Germany are very small businesses, many of them incredible world leaders. And there's a level of consensual management there and team, uh, team performance that is really unseen anywhere else uh, that I've ever been. And I said, you know, maybe that's one of the reasons why some of these small German companies really perform so well. What about the rest of the world, Bill? Certainly well, as, you, as you surveyed mm -hmm. uh, the American Man Management Association's uh, lists and data bank, you must have wondered, what about others? Yeah, we did. We, we, well, we've looked around the world considerably. And, uh, and the world does have a kind of uneven uh, performance in that area. For example, in places like, like uh, Japan, uh, uh, there's very much a collegial management system. Spain, Germany, Israel, very interesting. Uh, but there are other places in the world uh, where it may not be that way. I'm not really sure what it's like in China. I'm not really sure what it's like in Russia. Uh, and, uh, and one of the dilemmas that many uh, senior managers have in America, particularly in multinational corporations, is also dealing with multiple cultures. Because um, with multiple cultures, people are motivated and activated in different ways. Although it is interesting, as I studied this, this subject of leading with kindness, and the reason I picked out this subject was that I blamed the business that I've been in for 50 years, the television and movie business. Um, uh, they've, uh, you know, they've lionized these, uh, these uh, imperious bosses, you know, Devil Wears Prada, Wall, Wall Street, uh, uh, well, the uh, uh, Donald Trump uh, uh, program, uh, uh, whatever, I can't remember the name of it, uh, and uh, all of uh, the Simpsons, all of these kind of with these terrible uh, imperious bosses. And Michael O'Malley and I uh, knew that all of the research showed, and frankly, all of the practical experience showed treating people well, 
using the golden rule really works. And uh, why then are all of these terrible people highlighted when really the good people should be highlighted? And as I del delved into the, quote, golden rule, I just assumed it was kind of a biblically Christian principle. Well, it is It is in heavily in the Old Testament. It's in the Koran. It's in uh, Buddhist uh, writings. It is in, it is in writings of uh, ancient Greece. It's really kind of fundamental to our human state. So treating people right is something that people, that individuals and cultures and religions have known forever. And why we don't do that is amazing to me. Now, let me ask you straight. In your years in broadcasting, uh, commercial and then public, mm -hmm. you've met many, 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 many business leaders. How many of them would smile benignly at you, having read the book, and say to you, even now, even with what we're going through, come on now, what do you think? I think a lot of people would look at me uh, askance, <laughs> yes, and say, give me a break. You know, I've got to do these tough things. I've got to be the tough guy. And I think that's sad, because what that really is very often is insecurity on the part of the leader. Um, too often, leaders wind up in these jobs because they are kind of Peter principled there, or they had another job where they failed, but because they were in that category, they're some headhunting firm put them in there, even though they may not have done all that well in their previous job. Uh, and we, I see that happen over and over again. And I think to myself, if, if they were just perhaps a bit more human, they would guarantee themselves some success. Uh, and, uh, and, but, but it's a problem. So that's why we decided, Michael and I decided to write this book and see if we could get it into the drinking water of the American industrial complex. Whether we do or not, I don't know. But, you know, thanks to you and some other TV shows, maybe we can get the word out. Anybody replied to you with words about tough love? Uh, oh, yes, uh, very often. And as a matter of fact, we don't mean by leading with kindness. We have to be very careful. Uh, we spend the first, almost first two chapters talking about what kind is. And it's more reflective of, uh, of uh, really what Gandhi said uh, or was quoted as saying, which is, don't mistake my kindness for weakness. It doesn't mean that these are people that, are, that can be abused by their subordinates who don't have strong opinions, who can't make tough decisions, including lay off people and tell people they aren't performing and terminate them, et cetera. But, um, uh, but, but these are people that also represent kind of characteristics of compassion, integrity, gratitude, things that uh, are human and are, and are not afraid to say, I really appreciate your work, or I don't know what's right here, I need your help. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about a doormat. We're not talking about somebody who's a wimp and gets, you know, gets abused by his staff or her staff. Do you think people understand that? I know well, you write that, uh, yeah. but do people understand Well, that? we don't know. That's why we're out uh, waving the flag. We even, it was interesting, we'd, we've done a couple of, we're in, in the uh, 21st century uh, uh, technology world uh, trying to spread this. We have a very, very, uh, uh, profound, deep website called leadingwithkindness.com, which is pretty interesting. We have in it clips of various business leaders and their employees, uh, video clips. You know, we did a, a public TV show uh, as a companion to this book. So uh, we're trying to, you know, get, get it out in, in various ways we did with the American Management Association, what they call a webinar. I've never done webinar. a web webinar, which is a seminar all done on the web and had 3,000 people you know, while well, we we talked, communicating back with us online, it was pretty exciting. You're finally getting into the communications I know, you know, world. And I've right? learned how to run a computer. Right, <laughs> even even that. Bill, what about young people today? Well, that's very interesting. And um, uh, young people, there's something going on. There's something wonderful going on. Um, the introduction of our book is is written by Glenn Hubbard, the uh, dean of the Columbia Business School. Uh, you know, one of the top business schools in the world. Uh, and and quoted in the book uh, is a, our, is the associate dean of. Yese, I-E-S-E, the uh, very, very uh, uh, famous business school in Barcelona, Spain, considered one of the best in the world. And 
everybody's saying the same thing, and I'm finding it at my work at Fordham, at my work at the Columbia Business School and others, that, uh, that in the last two or three years, just about two or three years, suddenly there's a revolution, not at the business schools, but in the students. Five, ten years ago, certainly, students that would come to business school were the brightest and the best, but they had one goal, making money. And uh, they didn't want to necessarily do it unethically or anything, but they really wanted to make money. And that was paramount in their view. Now, these same stu the, the students that are there now, the new students, are also still the brightest and the best, the smartest you people you could ever imagine. But their goals are not just to make money. And all of a sudden, this is a change. They, it's coming from them. Where they found it, I don't know. They, they, wa they want to do good. They want to make money, but they want to do good. They don't, want to in, they don't want to destroy the environment. So business schools uh, are now preaching what they call the triple bottom line. And some of the most enlightened companies in America are pre preaching the triple bottom line. Making money, doing good in the society, and not harming the environment. That's the triple bottom line. It's interesting that you say that, and you obviously have been very much involved in mm -hmm. this, and the numbers. Mm -hmm. Because my understanding, both from my teaching and dealing with students, and from some of the other research that I've heard about, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, doing well seems for many, and I thought most American students, number one, mm -hmm. doing well, with the notion that later on one can do good, mm -hmm. but you first got to do well. Uh, we're not seeing that now. You mm -hmm. know, as I say, particularly at the top level business schools. I mean, certainly making money doing, doing well is uh, very much a part of it. And it has to be in business. I mean, businesses go out of business if they don't do well. But ultimately, to do really well, and to do well for the long, t long term, you've got to be doing good. That's what we say. Now, and that's what we believe. Now, in terms of Americans' belief mm -hmm. in a market system, the free market, the free market, the free market, mm -hmm. uh, equivalent only to deregulation, deregulation, mm -hmm. deregulation, how does your emphasis upon doing good first, mm -hmm. how does it resonate? Well, I mean, we can see uh, just recently what uh, the free market has delivered. The free market has not necessarily delivered uh, all good. And uh, an unregulated free market uh, where greed is allowed to o uh, overcome uh, good uh, can really destroy everything. And, the, and, in some, and we see elements of that in, uh, in our, uh, in our e e economics today. And so we know that a pure unregulated market is probably not the best thing. So, uh, and, and and there are other values that 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 people that that people need. They they need more than money. They need uh, to breathe fresh air. Uh, they need uh, uh, they need their health taken care of. They need also to feel that they're doing something of value. Uh, after a while, you know, workers will work hard for money for a short time, but not forever. They want more than that. And now there's also another kind of workforce. The, you know, when I was getting my PhD in uh, industrial psychology, organizational behavior uh, in Ohio at Case Western Reserve, uh, you know, we were studying factories and people doing kind of rote jobs and turning up the lights and getting more output out of people. Well, those places, while well, they still exist, they don't exist to the degree that they did 40 years ago at all. Now our workforces are knowledge knowledge workers. They we call them. They're people that have that bring something more to the party than just a rote uh, uh, profession. Or they bring more than their hands to the party. They bring their brains and that skill to get the most out of those people. You've got to mo motivate them entirely differently. And the best of those people are people that know they can go anywhere they want. They don't have to work for you. So they can go and work for the, your competitor and really do you some harm. Uh, one of the CEOs that we interviewed for our book said that he treats his employees like volunteers. Uh, 
And I thought, well, that was probably a pretty good experience for me, having run uh, uh, public TV in New York for uh, for 20 years, <laughs> that because I did have a lot of volunteers and uh, motivating them and keeping them happy because they were so key to our operation was a good experience for me because it probably helped me with the people who were not volunteers. And um, you think about the business that you and I have uh, run over the years, the public television world. There are a lot of people that could get jobs that are much higher paying other places. But why do they wind up working in public television? Well, because it has a kind of value system that, uh, that, that they like, that they respect. So that this is what you're doing with the old motivation studies of the 20s and the early 30s. You're saying, turn up the light, but mm -hmm. it's a different kind of light. Right. Well, that's well said. Yeah, it is. It's, uh, it's certainly a more spiritual one. And, 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 there been, and by the way, our studies uh, have been corroborated, or we have corroborated, depending on when the studies came, came out, by others who are, really, who are also doing this work. There have been some recent Harvard studies that have shown that some of the, the most successful companies in the world are ones that behave this, the, this way, meaning they have leaders who care about the people, who operate on a consensual way, who you know, care about environment, who care about, uh, about the health and welfare of their employees, treating employees like, uh, uh, like, good people, uh, uh, like the good people that they are, and people that have lives. Uh, you know, everybody comes to a job, uh, and they're not just cookie cutters. Everybody comes with his, his or her own background, and their, their families, and all, all this has to be dealt with and thought about if you're going to really maximize the productivity uh, uh, of these individuals. I don't mean manual productivity alone. I mean their thought productivity, which is now the most important thing you can have. I gather we did increase over the past decade, particularly the last eight years, individual work is productivity. Oh yes, we're very productive in this country. But what we did at the same time <clears throat> was not give them a stake. And that's what you're talking about, a human stake. That's right. Because, I mean, it doesn't mean that they even have to own the company, but they have to feel bought into the mission of the company and the values. CEOs uh, uh, of companies all over America have have done a great job, of the best companies all over America have done great jobs of that. Uh, companies like United Technologies, uh, you know, companies like Cummings Diesel, uh, very modern companies that were highlighted on our television show and on our website, companies like, um, like Google. Uh, and then there are small businesses. We highlighted a company uh, in uh, in Connecticut, a, a store called Mitchell's, uh, two stores. They're doing a hundred million dollars a year in business, selling very expensive clothing, with a staff that is so committed that if uh, an individual buys something there, they'll never buy at another store again because the service is so incredible. That's from the top. It's a family-run business all the way to the all the way to the bottom. Not for profit organizations. We we looked at uh, at a a, a school. What's the toughest school in America to get into, would you guess? Harvard. It isn't. <laughs> They're even tougher, believe it or not. Uh, and the school we highlighted was probably the toughest school in America to get into, Juilliard. And, uh, and you would think, gee, the kinds of people who go into Juilliard are performing, performance people. And they would really you know, be massively competitive, which of course they are, and have had rejection and, you know, fighting for the top for, uh, for years, you know, starting when you're 13 years old, playing the trombone or whatever it is, and or the piano. And um, uh, it turns out that that is a school that has loving leadership, Dr. Joe Polisi, the president of, the, of that school, and there is a camaraderie at the school uh, of the professors, of the students that is not to be believed. And all of that has come together that makes these performers perform even better because everybody is supporting one another. It is an amazing place. So it, it, management reaches, of course, beyond industry to not-for-profits, to all kinds of organizations, to, to organizations like, like your schools and your PTA and all. I mean, everybody can be a manager or has to be a manager. Well, it fascinates me what you said before in particular about your experience in public television uh, using volunteers or people who are near volunteers mm -hmm. in terms of their ability to do better financially mm -hmm. elsewhere. That's a fascinating insight. Mm -hmm. 
that uh, you would come to understand with that kind of need. Maybe that's what America's uh, commercial leaders need, a, stint, a stay in a, a volunteer situation. Well, you know, that's interesting because uh, I had had 35 years in commercial TV, the toughest there is, uh, and cable, and then went into public service broadcasting. And I think I mentioned to you on this program years ago that when I came into public TV, I thought, well, this will be like tea with Alistair Cook every afternoon. This is going to be a vacation compared to what I was doing. And, uh, and it turned out to be the toughest job I'd ever had because it is so complex with so many moving parts and so many different expectations and unclear, uh, unclear measurements. And I, and I thought after that, I thought, wow, if anybody can successfully run a, not, a big not-for-profit, running a commercial business is, uh, is a cream puff after that. Have you told many people that? I have. <laughs> they don't believe me. <laughs> Bill, what's the primary, in the one minute we have left, what's the primary reaction to leading with kindness? Well, I think we've gotten a lot of s sweet smiles and said, oh, that's, that sounds great. What we're hoping is, though, that it really starts to uh, change, change our culture. And so we're trying it on multiple levels. We did this website, leadingwithkindness.com, where you know hundreds of thousands of people have come. We're, uh, we've done our book now, which we're very, very proud of, and it's really kind of an academic book. It's not a soft, pledge public TV book. And we did a public TV show that I'm running around the country and giving speeches. So we're hoping it makes a difference. We're hoping we do get it into the drinking water at the, uh, at the office. Well, Bill Baker, you made such a difference at Channel 13, for Thank which you. I thank you so much once again that I'm sure you will with leading with kindness and uh, good luck with that and thanks for coming here again on The Open Mind. Thank you, Richard. And thanks too to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time and for transcripts of today's program with Dr. Baker, please send four dollars in check or money order to The Open Mind, P.O. Box 7977 FDR Station, New York, New York, 10150. Meanwhile, as another old friend used to say, good night and good luck. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Russell Sage Foundation, the Malkin Fund, May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.